I want to talk about the spirit that gives us hope. Hope is such a powerful and precious thing. And there's a lot of people living their lives, not just unbelievers, but believers, in need of hope. Romans 15, 13 says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come before You. We thank You so much. In Your presence, there is fullness of joy. We thank you for your presence here today that gives us joy, brings a smile to our face. God, you know that there's people today that need hope. And many of us today, we need more hope. Some of us today have misplaced our hope. I pray that your word, and more importantly, your Holy Spirit, will use the word to fill us with hope today. That not a single person, no matter what they're facing tomorrow, that not a single person will leave this place without hope. That is our prayer, and only you can do it. We pray this in Jesus' name. What is hope? Are faith and hope the same thing? They both deal with confident expectations. They both deal with belief and trust. But they're still a little different. And they're different enough that the word uses in the same verses faith and hope. So we know they're not exactly the same thing, although they're similar. I think the easiest way for us to sort of understand the difference in faith and hope is that faith is about today and hope is about tomorrow so faith is faith is for the present situation that you're in and hope deals with tomorrow and maybe what your prayer where your present situations may lead faith says God has my today and hope partners up and says God has my tomorrow understand that so they're closely connected And you really can't have one without the other. And their source is the same. The source is God. The scripture says that God is the source of all hope. That there is no other hope apart from Him. Have you ever been without hope? Do you know someone presently that needs hope? Psalm 42, verse 11, the psalmist asks this question. He says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? And then it's like a light comes on, the light of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I will put my hope in God. I will praise Him again. We always end up in an emotional mess when we misplace our hope when our hope is no longer in God that's us why am I so discouraged why am I such a mess why am I falling apart so my prayer is that today through the word the Holy Spirit will do what he did for the psalmist here and right there in the middle of the question the realization comes that says I will put my trust and hope in God and I will praise him again see some people put their hope in money and that's stupid some people put their hope in politics and government that's stupid earth it's a word in Blue Mountain (laughs) some people put their trust in themselves Their hope is in them. That's stupidest. 
But wherever your hope is, wherever tomorrow, whatever, what is tomorrow hinging upon for you? Like, what is tomorrow about that every, it's all hinging upon tomorrow? What is it? Is that your hope? So if it's not in the Lord, I'm not calling you stupid as much as I'm calling me stupid. It is wrong. It is not. It is dumb. <laughs> it is ignorant. It's not the right thing for us to put our hope in anything other than the Lord. And I believe that God has given me this message today so that He would show us and highlight for us where we have misplaced our hope so that we can place our hope where it belongs again and that we would understand that God is the only source for our hope because God wants you to have hope He really does He wants you to have hope why? because hope frees us up to be the people that God wants us to be we can't be the people He wants us to be if we don't have hope we can't be the light of the world if we don't have hope we can't be the joy and the love and the peace of God if we don't have hope for tomorrow if you've ever met someone without hope or if you've ever been someone without hope you know how devastating it can be why get out of bed why I do life at all? Do you ever wonder how in the world that the enemy can convince someone to take their own life? The first step is to take their hope. If he can convince us that there's no hope in tomorrow, that he's halfway there. So I'll say, wake up. Wake up. Look at your neighbor. You don't know what they're going through today. Look at your neighbor and say, God wants you to have hope, and so do I. Jeremiah 29 and 11. I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and hope. You ever sit and wonder? I have. I've... I've sat and wondered before, looking up at the stars at night or meditating and thinking, God, what do you think of me? Maybe you haven't had the best day. Maybe you didn't respond the way you should have. Maybe you didn't handle a situation like you wished you would have. And you're like, God, what do you think of me? Or maybe everything seems to be going wrong. And you're like, God, what do you think of me? I'll tell you what he thinks of us and what he reminds me of. Is that he thinks good thoughts toward you. That you might have a future and have hope. I believe he's thinking, Daryl, if you could just see my thoughts toward you, you would wake up with hope every day. If you could just see the future that I have in store for you, which is eternal, oh, you'd wake up with hope. you live your life with hope. There's no news station could steal it from you. No newspaper could take it from you. No post could take it from you. If you knew the thoughts that God had toward you, you'd wake up every day and go to bed every night with hope in Him. And that's what He wants. He wants you to have hope for tomorrow. He wants you to, he wants you to live in His abundant life hoping in Him. Because his hope is not a hope so, right? We use the word hope in the wrong way a lot of times. I hope so. Hope so. Hope so. You better hope so. <laughs> That's not God's kind of hope. God's kind of hope is an expectation, a belief, a knowing. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And so hope is not a wish. It's, it's, not a, it's not a prayer. It's not a coin in a fountain. It's not twinkle, twinkle, little star. It is a knowing. It is a believing. It is a trusting that my tomorrow is in the hands of God. And as bad as today may look, He holds my future in His hands. 
because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Hope. God wants you to have hope. Do you believe that if you pray for something and it's the will of God, that you'll receive it? His will for you is to be a person of hope. You see, hope is eternal. Hope is eternal. Y'all know what eternal means? Forever. Forever. We can't even grasp it, can we? I don't know how to grasp eternal. It's every, most everything about us is temporary. Right? 100 years from now, I won't have that truck out there. I won't, I won't have a home on Pine Alley 100 years from now. I won't have any of these clothes. Really, everything you see about me is temporary. Like what you're looking at, I won't have these glasses. I won't have this incredible figure. <laughs> I hope not. All right, bad, bad use. <laughs> not doing that. Y'all understand what I'm saying, right? Because 100 years from now, I'll be 146. I ain't gonna be here, y'all. Oh, you were to believe God for 100? No. I don't want y'all, no. No. <laughs> no. I'll be way past ready to be with the Lord <laughs> way before 146. Right? So everything, everything you see about me is, it is temporary. Almost everything in this life is temporary. But I will still have hope 146 years from now 1,046 years from now 10,046 years from now I will still have hope I will still have hope you see, I believe a Christian can't lose hope but they can find it in other words I believe that a believer always has hope in Christ even sometimes when they don't realize it sometimes when their mind's messed up or their heart's all out of whack but as believers, we have hope in Him. So we haven't lost it, but maybe we've misplaced it. Maybe we need to reconnect with it. And I believe that's the case for some of us today. Hope lasts forever because the source is eternal. This past week in Los Angeles, I was there for a World Missions Ministries uh, Summit. And so I was, man, I met some young missionaries that in their early 20s and they're they're ready to go out to these countries and just they're on fire and passionate to just spread the gospel of Jesus I met some missionaries that are going to be missionaries to Los Angeles and I said praise the Lord for that that God was calling them to that city and that's awesome it's a wonderful thing we had a tour guide that took us to Azusa Street how many's heard of Azusa Street before? Azusa Street um, and the Bonnie Bray House. And so, just, and I'm going somewhere with this, so just hang on with me for just, just a moment here. And so over 100 years ago, probably like 115 years ago, uh, there was a, a great outpouring of God's Holy Spirit and revival um, at Azusa Street. It started in a house on Bonnie Bray, Street, uh, where they let this young African American preacher named William Seymour get up on their porch and preach, and people would gather around in the yard, and the Lord just began to do something amazing, and they ran out of room, and so they moved down to Azusa Street. And they ended up with a 60 by 40 building there on Azusa Street, and they would have 1,500 people come through that place. And, and God just did some incredible things 
Uh, he poured his spirit out. Uh, he really, he shook some things up. I believe it was an authentic move of God. Uh, there's articles in the newspapers where obviously the secular world made fun of them and, w and what was going on and those kind of things. But they had three really good years of revival where God was really... Some of the, one of the cool things I thought is they didn't do church like, like this, like we do it today where all you guys are just looking at me up here on the stage. They like sat in a big circle and he, was, he would sit there in the middle and they all, that way they all sort of looked at each other as the body of Christ. And I thought that was really cool how they did that. They had a very knowledgeable guide out of the Assemblies of God. And uh, he was also a college professor. And he had done great, great research. And had actually been part of putting the road sign up on Azusa Street because there was no sign. And nobody really even knew exactly where it was because there's no church there now. It's just a open space in the middle of a uh, little Tokyo, they call it. And so he had done the research, found out where the building was. They put a plaque up and did signage and stuff like that. And, and uh, you guys just got to know me that I'm very, I may not look, look it, but I'm very analytical and, and you might would even say intellectual in the fact that I really like to research and find out and ask questions. And that's how that's how I learn because I love to learn things like that and so after our guide was over I got up went up there to him off to the side and said I gotta ask you I got what you know what what ended the revival and what what you know why is there no church here still and he gave a long answer but let me give you the gist of it and I'm going somewhere with this so hang tight and the gist of it was this that people ended it people being people people being people William Seymour throughout the revival continue to teach the people not to seek just the manifestations of the spirit but just to seek God whatever God did God did but that's hard for us as people. And it's easy for our source to become the things that God does and the manifestations of His Spirit. And that becomes our foundation and you might even say our hope. And when that gets out of whack, or when we, or when we see God do something miraculous or supernatural, and we automatically assume that that's the way God will always do it every time. And we get out of balance and we get out of, and we get out of whack and we miss out on maybe something new that God is wanting to do or something different that God is wanting to do. And so I believe it was an authentic move of the Holy Spirit that some of the people made it normative that this is the way it's always going to look every single time or else God's not in it. And so you had all these branches and divisions that came off of this, right? And we're one of them, by the way. We're one of them. And I think, I think when we look at these things, I know you're wondering, why are you talking about this? So I'm going somewhere with it. I told you I was, so hang on. When we take something wonderful that God does, if we're not careful, we'll place our hope in His blessings, in His gifts, in the things that He does. And we can take our eyes off of the giver. And that's when we mess up. And it can even come to the place, and I'm not saying this about Azusa Street or any of that, but it can even come to the place where it becomes idol worship. See, you can go back in your study, but you can go to, let me find my scripture here, because I want you to go there. Hold on. Let me make sure I have the right. Yes. Second Kings 18 and 4, you can go back in your study time. And we find out, you remember the brazen serpent? 
that God used to heal the people that had been bitten by the snakes. Remember that? Right? Moses lifted it up and they that looked upon it. And Jesus even referenced it in John chapter 3. That they looked upon it and they were healed. Did you know that brazen serpent became a, a, an idol? And that they kept it? And down through the years they started to offer incense to it? Because this was, this was a mighty thing that God did. And did you know that Hezekiah, one of the greatest kings of Israel, one of the first things he did when he came in is he got that brazen serpent and he broke it in pieces. Because only people can take something incredible that God does and can turn it into something hurtful. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, specifically chapters 12 and chapters 13 and chapters 14, talks about these incredible gifts that God gives to us. And these gifts are still available to us today. There is nowhere in the Word that the Bible says, no more gifts. These gifts are still available. And they are to equip and, and to strengthen and to edify the body of Christ. But Paul is very, very specific when he tells us that if we don't have the right foundation under these things, that things that were meant to be a gift can actually be hurtful and destructive. Specifically, you remember in chapter 13 where he says that I can, do, I can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if I don't have love, it's like a clanging cymbal. In other words, it becomes a destructive thing that people stop up their ears because they don't want to hear it. And he gives several other examples in that chapter of how things that are incredible, we can make them destructive and hurtful if we do not have our hope placed in the right things. In 1 Corinthians 13, at the end of the chapter there, in verse 12 and 13, he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide. He's telling us something very important here. Now abide faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is love, is love. We have three core foundational ingredients for the Christian life that will never change and will always be eternal. Faith, hope, and love. The Bible is very clear that hope is the most important. Very clear. Very clear. As a matter of fact, you can be out of whack and misunderstand and not have it quite right in many areas. But if you have love right, love will cover a lot of things. But you can be right in every other area, but you don't have love right, then you turn something good into something hurtful and destructive. So love is where everything hinges. Everything. But then he says there's two other things that are also eternal. Also eternal. Faith and hope. Chapter 13 clearly says that there will, be, there will come a time when the gifts of the Holy Spirit will fail. And he also makes it very clear that, that time, when that time happens, it will be when we see Jesus face to face. You can also go to 1 John. In other words, as long as we're living in this life, God intends to use the gifts of the Spirit to empower us, to strengthen us. Oh, but He's encouraging us to get it right, to make sure that we are having them used in us in a way that is beneficial and edifying and not bringing glory to ourselves, but glory to our God that's bringing light to the world. But it's very specific that there will come a time when these gifts will no longer be needed. They will have an ending. And, as sometimes I do, I step out on a little ledge here, and I want to be bold enough to say that even now, 
spiritual gifts are not foolproof in that 100% of the people you pray for don't get healed, not 100%. And 100% of prophecy that we hear is not correct. I don't know about you, but I've had somebody tell me something before about what God was saying to me and what I needed to do, and I walked away knowing full well it wasn't what God wanted me to do. Is it okay? I've been a little transparent here, but I'm just saying it. All right, that's the, that's the elephant in the room, I guess we'd say. That even now, because, because spiritual gifts are us, I mean, God's working through us, and sometimes we don't get it right, or sometimes people are faking it, or sometimes people are just crazy, or sometimes people have wrong motives, sometimes people are just using it as a way to get money or to, to bring glory to themselves. But there is a true and authentic So what happens if we base everything upon spiritual gifts when we know full well that they are not 100% because we're not 100% we end up in a place or people end up in a place where they're discouraged and they lose hope and that's why God, in His great wisdom and great sovereignty, in the middle of three chapters that deal specifically with spiritual gifts, administrations, operations, and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, in the middle of those three chapters, He says, I want you to know there's three things that will abide forever, and this is your foundation. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. So if anything else fails or anything else gets weird or, or anything else confuses you or if anything, everything else seems wrong, you, you can know that you've got an eternal foundation that cannot be pulled out from under you called faith and hope and love. We understand that love is the most important. And that love will be the atmosphere of heaven. Love is going nowhere. I mean, we're going to live in love in heaven. The atmosphere is love. When he creates the new heavens and the new earth down here, it's going to be love. Love for the Son. Love for God. Love for each other. There will be nothing to interrupt or disrupt or divide or sow discord. It will be love. And then faith is believing God and trusting him right now. In spite of what you see or hear, it's faith to speak to the mountain. It's faith to pray for the sick. It's faith to encourage one another. It's faith to get up out of the bed and say, this is going to be an awesome day because God is with me. It's faith for God to provide. Jehovah Jireh will show up. It's faith to believe when no one else will believe. It's faith to just stand up and say, I know whom I have believed. I trust my God. And God wants you to have hope. The eternal foundation and belief that because I belong to Him, my tomorrow is secure. And although I stand up and I speak to that mountain that you be removed in the midst of the sea, and in heaven God is saying, Son, I really need that mountain to stay there right now. So I'm going to teach you something. It's my hope that says, you know what? If that mountain's there tomorrow, my God's still with me. And if that mountain's there next week, my God is still with me. You hear what I'm saying today? If you've got hope, what can the enemy do? What can he do? So I want us to make three declarations of hope this morning. I want you to stand with me. Hallelujah. We may sing a song after we make these declarations. My voice is a little iffy today, so I'm really stepping out on a limb. But I believe the Lord dropped this song into my spirit. Let's make these declarations. 
Number one, my disappointments are God appointments. Say it with me. Say, my disappointments are God appointments. Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only that, well, let's do it like we do and celebrate recovery, all right? Let's read the verse together. You ready? Romans 5, 3 through 5. Read it. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. My disappointments are God appointments. Come on, give Him praise. That's good. If you're facing a disappointment today, come on, it's a God appointment. God's going to show up and He's going to show out. He's going to bring you through. Your hope is in Him. He's got you. Number two, my hope lives forever. Read this, 1 Peter 1 and 3. Let's go. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Colossians 1.27 To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. My hope lives forever. Hallelujah. All right, this is it. Number three, I will hope in Him. Hebrews 10, 23, read it. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those who wait, if you look it up in the Hebrew, Wait, another word for it is hope. It's the same thing. If you're waiting on the Lord, you're hoping in the Lord. You're trusting in the Lord. And if we will hope in the Lord, our strength will be renewed. Nothing will carry you through this life like hope. Hope is what carries us through. Hope is what holds us up. Hope is what keeps us together. We thank Him for it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. This song says victory in Jesus. That is our hope. That is our confidence. If I had to have victory on my own, there's no way I could ever have victory in my life. But my victory has been won by my Savior. <laughs> We're going to try it, so I need you to help me because I'm my voice is a little bit rough today. You know, like it's not every week, but that's what I'm saying today. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Well, I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood atoning And I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior Sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. Oh, he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Oh, I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealed. How he made the lame to walk again And he caused the blind to see And then I cried, dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit 
And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Oh, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. Oh, he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing. Sing it. Oh, victory in Jesus. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Y'all did great. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Communion. I would dare say we've done this. Well... I don't know. I'd probably say probably 60 times or so since the pandemic, I believe, we've probably received. It's been, we've done it just about every week. We've skipped a few weeks uh, that we did not do it. Uh, I don't want it to become a ceremony. We sort of talked about it in the sermon, didn't we? We don't want it to become just this something we do because it's something we've always done and it doesn't mean what it should mean. This is everything. This is our hope. Without this, not this specifically, but without the body and the blood, there is no victory in Jesus. There is no hope. There is no, there is no eternal. Not with Him. But because of what He did, we have it. So Father, we thank You for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that You would give Your Son to give his life for us that it would please you that he pay that ultimate sacrifice and that our Lord and Savior would do what he did for us while we were still sinners unbelieving rebelling you did it we thank you for this Lord in Jesus name Really, the foundation of our hope is in knowing that we stand righteous before Jesus. That before the Father, we are righteous. And we stand righteous because of the blood that was shed for us. He took our sins, and we know that. Sometimes we forget. He didn't just take, He also gave. He took our sins and He gave us His righteousness. And this is what the blood has done for us. Lord, we thank You that You would choose a priceless, precious gift and sacrifice to become our substitution. That atonement would be made through your blood. We can now enter into the Holy of Holies. We can come boldly before the throne of grace because your blood has been sprinkled on the mercy seat. And we are righteous. Thank you, Jesus. Because of this, we have hope. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord praise. We love you, Lord. We love you. God bless you. Have a, have a wonderful rest of your Sunday today. God bless you.